Hello and welcome to day two of Festival of Nature. My name is Emma Brisbane and I'm absolutely delighted today to be chatting with Rhys Charles, paleontologist and engagement officer at Bristol University and author of the upcoming book Frozen in Time, Fossils of Great Britain and Where to Find Them. So Rhys, let's welcome you to the screen, shall we? Hello. Hello, Rhys, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, nice to see you. Good to see you as well. So, okay, let's let's start with a little bit about you first. So obviously we're going to be talking about fossils and dinosaurs today, but how did you get into fossils? You know, what was your journey into paleontology and, and into what you do now? So I'm actually from the south coast of Wales, from Penarth, and I then grew up in the south coast of Dorset. And both um, of those okay. places are very famous for their fossils. So I think I was always surrounded by it. And I can't help but feel as well as a little bit of a sign because the film Jurassic Park came out within two weeks of me being born. So I think it was always kind of written oh, in the stars it was that definitely... I was going to follow this path. Yeah. Nice. OK, well, I'm going to start today with a fossil prop. So a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> I took my camper van down to the aforementioned Dorset coast. I went down to Lyme Regis, spent ages looking for fossils without really knowing what I was doing, if I'm honest, and found this. And I, I reckon it's a bit of an ammonite. Maybe you can correct me. I think you're exactly right. And actually, I've, I've got a prop here as well, which will help cement that because... Oh, you're out propping me. I, I've got a little bit of an ammonite as well. And hey, you can see how the one. ridges on this one are kind of matching what yeah. you've got there. We do. We line up very nicely. Where was yours from? So this one's actually from Watchet, which is on the Somerset coast. So only about 40 minutes away from Bristol. Oh, so wow. a pretty local site. So it's, that site is actually most famous for these amazing ammonites, which have been flattened and they get a rainbow iridescence color to them. But there are mm -hmm. also some giant ones as well. Sadly, I don't have any of the iridescent ammonites with me here, but oh. you could go out, couldn't go out and find them. Well, this this was going to be one of my questions, actually. So obviously I beetled off down to the south coast, which is, uh, you know, I went to Lyme Regis, which is really famous. That's where Mary Anning, the fam famous paleontologist and lady who's being portrayed by Kate Winslet in the film Ammonite out right now, which is, you know, as you've said, really, really well known as a place to find ammonites among other fossils in the cliffs. But actually, I maybe didn't need to do that because you're telling me that actually there's loads of sites near Bristol that we can find fossils. So I mean, where where should I have gone and what sort of thing could I find? So, yeah, there are definitely loads of sites near Bristol. The, the south of England generally is a really good place, really fossil rich. The nearest really good site to Bristol is a place called Ostcliff, which if you anyone in the audience who was listening to Jack Lovegrove just before me, he mentioned that as well. And that's a really good place to um, find lots of fossils from this old cave deposit where things have gotten washed in a bit torn around. So they are a bit a bit jumbly, but there are lots of fossils there. Alternatively, there are places like Watcher on that Somerset coastline. You mm -hmm. can go to the south coast of Wales to places like Penarth, as I mentioned before, where you can find a lot more um, Jurassic marine reptile material up there as well. So your things like the ichthyosaurs and the plesiosaurs, the flippers. I've got a little toy ichthyosaur here. So oh, everyone knows what I'm nice. talking about. So th these kind of things are quite common up there, along with all the classics like ammonites. So the sites around Bristol, are we talking uh, kind of marine fossils, you know, ammonites, ichthyosaurs, uh, corals and things? Or are we talking like terrestrial based fossils? What sort of thing can we find? So most of them are marine. But what's happened with the Oscliff site in particular, which is at the base of the old Severn Bridge, the White Bridge, not the Blue Bridge. Um, what's happened there is that uh, it's basically things that fall into the sea and then being washed into a cave. So you have got some terrestrial fossils there as well. So you might find little bits of um, potentially even dinosaur. So uh, things like Thecodontosaurus, the Bristol dinosaur, you might be able to find there as well. Well, you've led us in quite nicely there. Talk to me a little bit then, a little bit about the Thecodontosaurus. As you said, this is Bristol's own dinosaur, isn't it? It's, it was found in 1834. So tell me, yeah. what, what actually is it and why is it so special to Bristol? So Thecodontosaurus is basically a small sauropod dinosaur. So if you're aware, if you reach back to your childhood memories of dinosaur knowledge that I'm sure everyone has tucked away, the really long necked dinosaurs, it's basically a very early member of that family. So about 200 million years ago, this creature, which would evolve its family into these giants, was only about two meters yeah. long and only about the size of, say, a sheep. So a very different kind of dinosaur than we're used to picturing. But what I think is very cool about the Bristol dinosaur as well is, as you say, it was found in 1834, which was actually eight years before the word dinosaur was even invented. 
it oh, was really? only the fourth dinosaur we ever discovered and named. So it's very important in the history of paleontology as well as the history of dinosaurs as well. Wow. Did um, What did we call them before we gave them the name dinosaur? Do you know? Well, when Thecaton sources first found, they thought it was a kind of crocodile. So they would have they would have called it something like a, an alligator or crocodile, things like that. And it was only when they'd found, it was mostly the first three, but Theco just kind of sneaks in there as well. When they found these three animals, they couldn't possibly relate to being an elephant or a rhino or things like that. They realized this was a whole new group they needed to classify. I like that you call him Theco as well. I love a little, little yeah. nickname. <laughs> I think on source is a bit of a mouthful to say every time. It is. When I was writing it out to 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 come up with some questions, I had to sit and I'd say it several times over just to make sure that I'd got it so it could roll off the tongue. But um yeah. most of us just use Thico, it's much easier. Yeah, you should have told me this before from now on. I'm gonna call him Thico. But um but, I mean, okay, speaking of Thico, you also run the Bristol Dinosaur Project, don't you? Which is a really exciting public engagement initiative that's part of your work at Bristol University. So can you tell us a little bit more about what that is? Yeah, so amazingly, the Bristol Dinosaur Project is now actually 21 years old. So it's a very long running project. And what the most part of what we do now is we go out to schools and groups like that. We've also done things like Girl Guides and um, Scouts and groups like that. And we basically take our fossils out. We give kids an interactive experience learning about the animals that used to live all those millions of years ago. I actually just got the, the logo on this notebook here as well. So you can see oh, what I'm talking about. Very nice. <laughs> um, yeah, so... That's what we do now, but in the past, it's also been a research project. So it did have lottery heritage funding a few years ago. And from that, we went through all of the bones of the Ecodontosaurus, the originals from eight, the 1830s. And we basically used that, got the most up-to-date scientific knowledge to put together a model, which if you've been to Bristol Museum, you'll have seen the model we developed, which was uh, made by the amazing paleo artist, Bob Nichols. And that's there, you can see it with this little blue crest on its chin, which was just a bit of a, a guess to think about what kind of displays these animal could have used. And it's a really cool model because it is life size. So you can go there into the museum and be face to face with the Bristol dinosaur. I, I love Bristol Museum. It's definitely one of my favorite places in Bristol. Um, and I, I have to admit, I imagine it must be really fun working with kids. And of all the things to try and talk to kids about, dinosaurs has got to be one of the good ones. I remember being obsessed with dinosaurs when I was younger. I used to watch that TV show, Walking with Dinosaurs, just over and over and over again. It, it must be really fun just walking into a school group and saying, hey, guys, let's learn yeah. about the dinosaur that was found here. It, it's absolutely amazing when as soon as you tell the kids that you're from the Bristol Dinosaur Project or you put that logo up on their whiteboard and they start freaking out. It's a great feeling. And it's amazing to well to tap into some of their creativity and their love of dinosaurs, because one of the activities we regularly do, which is to get kids thinking about adaptations, different um, ways that dinosaurs have evolved to live in their environments. We get them to design their own dinosaurs. And some of the things they come up with are absolutely amazing and it's just some of the best souvenirs to get from these trips is when the teachers give you these drawings afterwards sometimes and nice. i'm just going to say as well one, one of my all-time favorites um a, a seven-year-old girl in one school we went to drew a pretty good t-rex and the t-rex was wearing a t-shirt and written on that t-shirt in the most death metal handwriting i've ever seen was grunge never dies <laughs> which was <laughs> incredible Age seven. That's Age fantastic. seven. <laughs> I hope that your home office is just plastered with all of these drawings to inspire you. Mm, and I, I've got a team of amazing volunteers as well at the University of Bristol who come out with me to these schools, and I love sending them out to show them all the amazing work that we've been doing. Oh, that's amazing. That sounds so much fun. So, yeah. um, okay, right. While we're sort of talking about your home office, you were pretty busy during lockdown. You were one of those guys. You wrote a book, didn't you? You were really productive while the rest of us just put our feet up. <laughs> tell, me, tell me a little bit more about your book. So it's called Frozen in Time, Fossils of Great Britain and Where to Find Them. It's coming out later this year, isn't it? Yeah, so it's coming out in autumn, in October time. And um, so essentially what it is, is a guided tour from the very north of Britain, so from the Scottish islands all the way down to the south coast, and pointing out a handful of fossil sites for each region where people can go and explore and the way that I've made the book is essentially, instead of just saying you can find the same bivalve shells here and here and here and here, I've tried to take a mascot for each uh, fossil site that I talk about. So for example, um, 
if we go somewhere like Wren's Nest near Birmingham, um, which if any of you follow me on Twitter, that was where the fossils I, I posted came from. And that is a really famous site for an animal called uh, the Dudley bug, which is a species of trilobite called calamine. And so that's the kind of way I've made this book is to take a site, tell you a brief overview of what's there, how to get there, what you can find, but then to focus in on one species that you can find there as a mascot. And in this case, these trilobites, which are little fossils like this. So you can see all the, like, like a prehistoric woodlouse that lives in the sea. And I've just basically talked about all of their history and their anatomy and their evolution and how they lived. So do you find that some of the fossils that you've got on your desk will help inspire you as a writer? How, how does your kind of connection with nature and prehistoric beings uh, help you in terms of that creative writing process? I think it's just good to to get out there and do it because the amazing thing about these fossil hunting locations is that most of them are kind of away from the city centres. They are a bit more peaceful and serene. So you can kind of get there and you can let your mind wander as you're just looking at these rocks. And it does inspire you to do things. A lot of people like going out there and sketching what they're finding and things like that. So I think just generally being out there helps inspire that kind of creative process, which I'm not much of a sketcher. So for me, it is a bit more... Of the write writing it. about it exactly yeah <laughs> <laughs> the much easier option obviously of course absolutely um do you have i don't know if this is a cheeky question do you have a favorite spot or is this something that you kind of want to keep to yourself i i, I happily share my favorite spots i think um mine is the beach of panath in south wales because i partly because i I'm from there and so I've got a lot of fond memories but also it is a really amazing spot to go to find fossils um, lots of ammonites, lots of these smooth-shelled bivalves, which are basically just seashells. So you see actually in the background that we've got here, there's a few bivalves mm. up just above my head. And there, there are some really amazing ones there, but you can also find these marine reptiles. I've actually got this little bone here, which doesn't look like very much to the kind of untrained eye, but it's actually a bit of a flipper from a plesiosaur. So if you think about the Loch Ness Monster, that kind of animal and um, this is a bit of their arm essentially that I've got here. How do you go about I mean as you said to the untrained eye to me it just looks like a nice lump of rock how do you go about actually pinpointing that and saying right that is specifically part of a flipper of this particular species? Yeah so it's, it is all about practice making you better each time you go out there but the main trick is to actually think about spotting the regular amongst the irregular so if you think about walking along a pebble beach and you've just got random shapes of rock, but um, things like an ammonite especially have a really regular shape. So if you can spot that kind of geometric pattern, like or this bone here, which I was showing just now, it's a bit too smooth. It's a bit too perfect a shape oh. to be just mm. a random pebble. And there's also things like the coloration as well. You can see this is quite a, a black rock and the fossils in this area preserve in that kind of color. So it's just about practice going out there and you will um, certainly overlook a lot of things when you first go out there. But the more you go out there, the better you get. In fact, when I showed this one to my father, who was with me when I found it, he said he was shocked. He said, like, oh, I used to throw things like into the sea because I made good skimmers. <laughs> so <laughs> no, if, exactly. if you look at a rock and think that'll make a really good skimmer, maybe think first and think, is it actually a, a just a skimmer or is it something I should maybe keep? Oh, that's brilliant. I, lo I love that. Looking for the regular among the irregular. That's, re that's really cool. So have you got any like top tips then for your amateur fossil hunters other than that? Um... Yeah. So obviously when I say go to the beach to find fossils, well, I'm not talking about the sandy shores beaches because those aren't going to be good fossils. When I say that, what paleontologists think of when they say beach is those classic rocky slopes, the cliff sides and what kind of is coming down from there. So Obviously, when I say that, a good top tip is to stay away from the cliffs because the reason we're getting those fossils is because they're falling down the cliffs and you don't want to be under them when they're coming down. So you can actually find a lot of fossils just by stepping back a bit because once they come off the cliff, they're going to get caught in the wash and they're just going to be scattered along the beach. So you don't need to be necessarily at the very base of those cliffs to find those fossils because they can be found just all over the place. And with guides like my book, I'm just going to plug it again. Um, it can point you in the actual beaches where you should go. But also there are communities of fossil hunters online who often have forums saying, oh, there was a cliff fall in this part of Charmouth recently and there's some good stuff coming out of it if anyone's nearby and wants to have a look. 
So just looking at those forums and seeing um, what the local experts are saying is a good way of going about it. And it's good to build those connections as well, just in case you do find something amazing and need a little bit of help getting it out of the ground. It's good to have people who know what they're doing to help you with that. What's the what's the system? What's the procedure? What if you found something absolutely massive, like a really well preserved entire ichthyosaur or something, and you were the first person to find it? Maybe you put it in your boots and you take it home. But I would think a lot of people would maybe think this needs to go in a museum or this needs to go off to research. Like, how, what do you do if you stumble across something like that? Yeah, exactly. So, if you find a whole skeleton like that, odds are you're not going to be able to do anything about it because it's <laughs> it's going to be huge and you're not going to be able to move it and you're going to break your back if you try. So the best system to do is to actually just mark out where you found it. If you think about local landmarks that you can use, or perhaps even if you've got a, a walking stick or something, then run off the beach, find someone, find one of those communities of fossil hunters who can come and help you look at it. And then it becomes a bit more of a team effort. And usually the museums, local museums then get involved with such activities. So often it's a case of they'll say, we help you get out of the ground it can go in our museum and you can visit it whenever you want and it saves you from having this t several tons of rock in your house which is pretty good yeah pretty pretty good but that would be quite impressive wouldn't it when you invite people around for for dinner like oh don't mind me just walk past it. yeah where's the bathroom oh it's just door on the left behind <laughs> the massive fossil yeah yeah <laughs> And I mean, you mentioned that quite a lot of the time we can find them at the base of cliff falls and, and rock falls. How do we stay safe uh, when we're when we're fossil hunting and not get too overexcited and put ourselves in dangerous situations? So if you are a, a cliff fally kind of area, a simple thing like a hard hat is is very useful because a lot of time you just get little fragments of rock falling off the cliff, but a little fragment going at that kind of speed off a cliff could do some damage. So a hard hat where it will just bounce off is a lot better than it hitting your head. And a good safety tip as well for Bristol, especially local fossil hunting around here in the south of Wales, is to remember the tides mm. because the Severn, obviously, it's easy to forget, has the second largest tidal range of anywhere in the world. It's kind of easy to forget that amazing record is held just off our coast. So make sure that you are checking when you're going to these sites, when is the high tide coming in? Because you do not want to get cut off up there. So you want to you want to go at kind of time when the tide's going out and you've got plenty of time to explore the beach and get off safely before the tide comes roaring back in again. Do you have any favourite finds that you can share with us? Yeah, so my all-time best find is actually from Panath again, which was one of those plesiosaurs, so a bit like this, but um, mm. a bit more of the skeleton, somewhere between 60 and 70% of it I've got, which for paleontology is actually amazing. A lot of people um, think you can go out and find whole skeletons, but odds are you're going to find fragmented bits most of the time. So 60, 70% is actually amazing. That's and it a is in these old chunk of a dinosaur. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's actually, that's not a dinosaur. Oh. So the plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs, all of these guys, they did live at the dinosaur times, but they were not dinosaurs. They were just related to them. Okay. A bit like how you would say, um, like a turtle isn't a crocodile but they are related. It's kind of that thinking. The obvious question here is then, what is a dinosaur? What defines a dinosaur? So for the most part, dinosaurs are terrestrial. So they live on ground. Mm. There's a, a few dinosaurs who might have been able to swim, but for the most part, they're on ground. The main defining feature that separates them from the reptiles around them is um, the way they position their legs. So if you think about a crocodile, they're kind of squatting, hunched over with their legs up to the side. A dinosaur has brung its legs directly underneath its body. Oh. And that is a, a major defining feature of the dinosaurs. And then you've got other things like um, feathers, for example, which are only found on dinosaurs like birds. Oh, fantastic. Well, I've definitely learned some stuff today, I can tell you that. So um, what other kind of weird and wonderful stuff is going on in the paleontology department where you work? Uh, so there's, amazing, there's a whole range of people working out these kind of different questions about weird and wonderful wildlife that lived millions and millions of years ago. So some of the scientists are working on figuring out how pterosaurs might have entered the sky, how they might have taken off, because it's pretty obvious to see once they're up there, they've got these huge wings, but how did they get up there in the first place is a question we're looking into. Mm. A big area of Bristol research as well is about um, paleo colour. So the kind of different colours that animals used to be in the past, which is something that for a long time we thought would be impossible to know. But over the past, it's just over 10 years now, and it was actually work first done at 
Bristol University were the first to discover the colour of a dinosaur by looking closely at their feathers and finding these structures called melanosomes. And depending on whether they were like egg shaped or sausage shaped or circular shaped, you could figure out what colour these animals were. And the oh, first wow. one we discovered, a dinosaur called Cynoceropteryx, was actually ginger. Oh, amazing. Oh, brilliant. Wow, that's really that's really cool. Because otherwise, I suppose you're you're just kind of plucking colours from thin air and guessing what you think they might look like. That's really, really great that you can yeah, actually exactly. use science to, to know. Gosh, it's fascinating. So have you got any advice then, maybe before we wrap up, um, for people who would like to get into paleontology as a career? and do something a bit like what you've done yeah so i think just hobby fossil hunting is a really good way of getting into it and you can learn all about how these animals kind of fit together how the bones work just by going out there and seeing them yourself and also by just going to museums and places like that so bristol museum obviously has these amazing galleries of um it's sea dragons gallery which is full of those marine reptiles and it's dinosaur gallery and it's geology gallery that can help you and in, inspire you to think of what you might be able to find what you might want to learn about these fossils by looking at them and if you are then a, a bit older you could even think about potentially volunteering with these kind of institutions as well because they're always looking for volunteers for various projects they've got on especially once things have opened up again not so much now but when things have opened up again they'll be looking for volunteers again it's great to get involved in that kind of process and see how you might be able to help the science. Fantastic. So before we head off today then, um, best of luck with the book launch. I'm really looking forward to reading it. Remind us all when it's coming out and where people can find it. So it's coming out in October. Um, I actually can't remember the, top, the exact date off the top of my head, which is kind of bad, but it's October time. And you can find it online currently if you want to pre-order it. It's at, you know, Waterstone sites, Amazon, all those kind of sites as well, if you do want to pre-order it. There you go. A link's just come up at the bottom of the screen, I've seen. Oh, fab. We're very smooth here at Festival of Nature. We're very <laughs> well prepared. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much. I certainly am going to be heading out this summer and having a little look and see if I can actually find some fossils near Bristol, a bit closer to home, looking for the regular in amongst the irregular. So thank you so much, Reese, And everybody, don't forget to check out the rest of the amazing content that we've got, not just today, but the rest of the week at Festival of Nature. You mentioned Bristol Museums there. There's also going to be a short film at some point in the week where we go into the archives of Bristol Museums and see some of the things that you don't normally see on display. So thank you very much, Reese. Have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. Thank you for talking to me. No problem.